Terraforming. Uh, science or science fiction? Well, what is terraforming? Terraforming is the concept that you can alter a planet's environment uh, to make it suitable for a human habitat. Turns out, actually, the word terraforming itself is a science fictional word. Uh, it was invented by uh, Jack, uh, Jack Williamson back in 1942. He invented it uh, in a short story, Collision Orbit, in astounding science fiction in 1941. Actually, that was the first of his CT uh, stories. Uh, but it actually got picked up uh, by Carl Sagan in 1973, along with two other uh, astronomers and futurists, uh, Burns and Harwick, uh, and turned into, well, science or science fiction? That's a good question. At least something that legitimate scientists could talk about. Well, but science fiction kind of loves terraforming. In fact, the first real mention of terraforming uh, was in Last and First Man, Olaf Stapleton's uh, great classic. In fact, uh, I believe, let's see, I believe it was the fifth man who terraformed uh, Venus, uh, ignoring the fact that there is an indigenous species uh, on Venus. Uh, they just sort of ignore them and, and terraforming. It doesn't actually go well for the fifth man who eventually go extinct. Uh, but then it was picked up by a lot of uh, other science fiction writers. Uh, Robert Heinlein with Farmer in the Sky, of course, quite famously, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy, uh, Pamela Sargent's Venus Trilogy. It's a little book I had to, to throw in, World Makers. It's a collection of uh, science fiction stories about terraforming, uh, which Gardner Desois uh, uh, edited. I had to throw that in because I have a, a story in that one. So what do you think? Is terraforming, is it already but the engineering? Uh, or is terraforming a astounding tale of super science? <laughs> well, let's look into it. Let's do a thought experiment. Uh, let's terraform the moon. How can we make the moon a body that we could live on without a spacesuit? Well, good advantage of the moon is it's the same distance, more or less, from the sun as the Earth. So the equilibrium temperature is about right. At least we got one thing right, the temperature. Uh, of course, because it has no atmosphere, that goes from about minus 150 degrees C at night to about plus 100 degrees C. We'd better equalize that out, but OK. Unfortunately, it's too small to hold an atmosphere. That is for two reasons. Uh, one is called genes escape. A body with gravity has an escape velocity. Molecules move around as they uh, have thermal velocity. So if that thermal velocity is enough so that even a tiny amount of them are greater than escape velocity, those ones that are greater than escape velocity will leave. And over the course of thousands and thousands of years, that adds up. Uh, and it turns out it's not actually the temperature down here that matters, but the temperature of the atoms that closest to space, the ones farthest away, the exosphere. There's another process called solar wind ablation. As you know, there's a solar wind coming out from the sun. Turns out that can ionize atoms in the upper atmosphere and strip them away. That's the problem with Mars. Uh, the atmosphere of Mars wasn't lost mostly from genes escape. It was lost from solar wind ablation. So it turns out if we gave the moon an atmosphere, uh, it would only last about 3,000 years before escaping. Man, such a short period of time, except, wait a second, that's uh, as long as our civilization's been around. Humans just don't plan for thousands of years, so no single human civilization has actually lasted that long. Uh, a couple of the Egyptian dynasties came close, but not quite. Uh, so we just need to replace the atmosphere every 3,000 years, no problem, or more precisely, it's somebody else's problem. Uh, and for those of you who pay attention to such things, that's exactly what Edgar Rice Burroughs proposed for Mars, is that they have an atmosphere factory at helium that gives Mars an atmosphere. Well, but how do you do that? 
Well, it turns out if you calculate it, to give it just one PSI of pure oxygen, that's about the minimum that it takes for a human to breathe. You need about one PSI uh, of pure oxygen. Uh, would be 200 trillion tons of oxygen. Uh, well, it turns out lunar rock is 50% oxygen. That's what rocks are made of. They're made of silicates, uh, silicon oxide. So we need to refine the oxygen out of about a 50 kilometer cube of soil. Well, you can imagine that, but you know, that's really pretty much an astounding tale of super science because the energy to do this is well beyond the bounds of existing technology. So, a couple more problems. Oh, we gotta give the moon some water. It's pretty much absent of water. Well, maybe from comets. We'll talk about that in a second. We need to give it carbon and nitrogen. That's what we need for plant life. We gotta start an ecosystem. Uh, and the result will be a temporarily terraformed moon, where temporarily means only gonna last 3,000 years, guys. <laughs> Better not get used to uh, staying there. With 14 days of sun and 14 days of night. So you'd better make sure there's enough atmospheric circulation that the atmosphere doesn't just freeze out on the dark side. So these are exercises left for the student. Uh, and in your homework assignment, you could sort of work out some of these details. Uh, but let's talk about some of the other slightly bigger planets. Here's the planets of the inner solar system, the rocky planets. Uh, what astronomers call the Earth-like planets, although, frankly, Mercury is not very Earth-like, and, you know, almost the same size as the Earth. Venus isn't all that Earth-like either. But let's look at how about Mars? Can we terraform Mars? Well, Kim Stanley Robinson thinks we can do it. In fact, he thinks we can do it remarkably quickly. Mars is a cold, cratered desert. Uh, back in the 1890s and early 1900s, of course, some astronomers thought they saw canals on Mars. Well, unfortunately, in the early 1960s, the first space probes to Mars really disappointed a lot of science fiction writers. No canals, not much atmosphere. In fact, the atmosphere is uh, one half of one percent the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere, that comes to about 1.6% the density, and it's carbon dioxide. Uh, and as an average temperature of even colder than outside in Toronto in February, <laughs> it's minus 65 C. A little bit larger negative number in Fahrenheit. But oddly enough, despite that very, very low temperature, Mars had liquid water in the past. There's some pictures from the Viking orbiter, uh, and you can see these dried riverbeds. Uh, here's a picture from the Opportunity rover. That's my rover. Uh, and those are sedimentary rock deposits which were deposited by very briny, well, maybe shallow oceans, maybe briny lakes, but it's the salts that are left behind when an ocean evaporates. Uh, don't put it on your food because it turns out they're mostly sulfate salts. Uh, that's Epsom salt also. <laughs> but in the past it had liquid water, so it must have been warm in the past. Can we bring Mars back to its infancy and give it a thick atmosphere and a greenhouse effect again? Well, let's think about that. What do we have to do? We've got to increase the atmospheric pressure. Uh, today, it's about 1% of Earth levels. Better bring that up. Uh, we need to increase the temperature. Currently, minus 65. Let's rank that up a little bit. And we have to make the atmosphere breathable. I actually put that in as an optional. We could do some sort of terraforming if we could just warm it up and increase the pressure. We could make something that plants could live on. We could make something you could go outside without a spacesuit if you just had an oxygen breather. Well, that wouldn't be too bad. So 
nice to have breathable atmosphere, but that's actually a secondary consideration. The first is to have an atmosphere at all. Well, turns out actually these requirements work together. If you increase the atmospheric pressure, particularly if it's greenhouse gases, the temperature rises. But that works the other way around too. If you increase the temperature, the soil outgasses, the polar caps melt, the ice in the soil enters the atmosphere, and it increases the greenhouse effect. Well, so the greenhouse effect is kind of the key. I'm sure you've heard about the greenhouse effect with respect to Earth. The greenhouse effect is actually the tool that we use to understand the temperature of all of the planets. Uh, it's basic physics, straightforward. Energy comes in from the sun and heats the planet. Uh, the planet emits infrared radiation because everything that's heated emits infrared radiation. But if the greenhouse gases absorb a little bit of that radiation, they get hot, they re-radiate infrared radiation, and that heats the planet. That's technically called radiative forcing. Works on Earth, you've heard about it on Earth. Uh, works on Venus big time, I'll talk about that in a second, but it also happens on Mars. We need more of it. Well, okay, all we gotta do is give greenhouse effect to Mars, more of it. Well, in fact, uh, let's see, a couple of scientists had suggested, well, there's better greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide's pretty good. Methane's a little bit better, but there's some really good greenhouse gases, the halocarbons, the chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, they can have very long atmospheric lifetimes, they're hard to destroy in the atmosphere, and very high infrared absorption. So we can put these halocarbons into the atmosphere. Uh, we could increase the greenhouse effect on Mars, and as we increase it, we'll start getting some of the carbon dioxide out of the soil, out of the polar caps, and increase the pressure. So, well, Zerbrun and McKay calculated that we could get 20 degrees C of warming with only one one thousandth of an atmosphere of chlorofluorocarbons. Turns out that's uh, 423 million tons. Uh, but they said, well, no problem. For a factory that makes two and a half thousand tons an hour and run it for 20 years, uh, we could do that with only 12 uh, gigawatts of power needed. That's less than the amount of power it takes to time travel. Uh, <laughs> the average temperature is minus 63. That would bring it up to a warm minus 43. So they were hoping, well, maybe at minus 43, we'd get some of this feedback effect and warm up the planet some more. If you don't, turns out you need a lot more chlorofluorocarbons. If you want to bring it to 40 degrees rise in temperature, bring the average temperature up to nearly minus 25 degrees C, uh, it's going to take uh, a lot more power. Uh, and you're going to have to produce about 8,600 tons uh, per hour. Well, not out of the question, but let's think about that a little bit more. How else can we warm up a, a planet? Uh, think about it. Well, what the heck? Let's concentrate the sunlight. So a proposal is let's just raise the temperature of Mars by putting mirrors in orbit around Mars and focus the sunlight down on the Mars to heat it up. Those are essentially just very thin solar sails. Uh, but big ones. So you need a lot of mirrors. How many mirrors? Well, you're getting 43% of Earth's solar intensity. To bring that up to the same intensity as Earth, we need a factor of 2.3. That would be 45 million square kilometers of mirror area. A thousand mirrors, each one is 250 kilometers in diameter. And just for the sake of accuracy, I have to point out there's a lot of corrections that I didn't include. It's a lot of mirror area, but not necessarily out of the question. 
for our future super science. So as Mars warms, the carbon dioxide in the water evaporates from the polar cap, it outgasses, but wait, is there enough? We can warm it up, but is there enough there to give us what we need? Well, turns out the best current estimate is that if we get rid of all that carbon dioxide trapped in the polar caps, all the carbon dioxide in carbonates, all the carbon dioxide in the soil, we get to about 7% of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, that's about the pressure at twice the elevation of Mount Everest, a little bit below the breathable pressure. And uh, again, for the sake of being accurate, I have to point out, we don't know for sure where all of that carbon dioxide is. We don't know if there's more trapped somewhere. This is the carbon dioxide that we can account for. But as we do that, we can see Mars heating up. Uh, the valley systems begin to flood. We start seeing erosion for the first time in a billion years. What does Mars look like when it's terraforming? Well, actually, I wrote a novella about a partially terraformed Mars uh, several years ago. The novella is called Echopoesis. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, turns out, after I wrote that novel, we put a orbiting satellite around Mars measuring the elevation of Mars. Uh, and the scientists made these beautiful maps of Mars, elevation maps of Mars. And turns out when they colored the elevation maps, they used blue for low elevation. And then the reds and Earth colors, or I should say the reds and Mars colors, uh, for the high elevations. So this is exactly where the oceans would be. The oceans are where they colored it blue, and the highlands are where they colored it the greens and reds. So I took days drawing my map of Mars to figure out where the oceans would be, and now you just can Google it and it pops up these images. Uh, but for those who read that, uh, that story. Uh, so we were parked over here and went down to the Hellas, Hellas Ocean. Some artist conceptions. Uh, here's Olympus Mons, the greatest volcano in the solar system. Well, it would be actually right on the edge of this global ocean. Uh, here it is on the edge of the global ocean. Here's a visualization of the planet. Here now you can see the Valles Marineris has become kind of the uh, long, narrow bay of Marineris. Uh, well, that would be nice, but wait a second, wait a second, hold on here. Uh, where did all that water come from? Well, the water on Mars is mostly gone. Turns out when water evaporates, it's hydrogen and oxygen in the upper atmosphere, it's hit by ultraviolet light, splits off into hydrogen, the oxygen rusts the surface of Mars. That's why it's red. It really is the rusty planet. The hydrogen, however, goes out into the upper atmosphere as hit by the solar wind and leaves. Not really much water on Mars. Well, I said not much, but there's some water on Mars. How much water is there on Mars? Most of it actually is frozen in the polar caps. That's the north polar cap. So if we melted that polar cap, uh, melted the south polar cap, which is smaller, we get about an average depth of 100 meters of water, sorry, 100 feet of water across the planet. That's not very much. Uh, you know, a moderate lake is deeper than, a, than 30 meters. So if we want to get that nice water, cover half the planet with a half kilometer deep ocean, and I have to say the Earth's ocean uh, is average 3.8 kilometers, and I see I've got to change that slide and put the decimal point. Uh, ocean depth is 3.8 kilometers. So about one-tenth as deep as the Earth's oceans. Uh, we need about 150 million cubic kilometers uh, of water. Uh, for those who don't like to think in cubic kilometers, that's 150 quadrillion tons. That's a lot of water. Uh, where do we get it from? Well, can we get it from comets? Turns out there's a lot of comets out there. 
Uh, if we can go out into the Oort cloud, there are actually literally trillions of comets. There's enough of them out there. Uh, there are icy snowballs, or maybe they're snowy ice balls. Uh, but how do we get 150 million cubic kilometers of water? Well, Halley's Comet is actually a pretty big comet. It's 1,000 cubic kilometers. Uh, so we need 150,000 comets as big as Halley's Comet to give us those shallow oceans across Mars. Moving a trillion ton comet is going to be a bit of an engineering challenge. Uh, so we will leave that to the engineers uh, and go forward. But something we can think about is maybe we don't need those big oceans. Uh, maybe we can get by with a little less oceans uh, and just accept it won't be completely Earth-like. Well, beyond that, we have to do a process called ecopoiesis. Uh, literally, that means forming an ecosystem. So all of that biology stuff needs to be done. Uh, we need to have the phosphorus, we need the carbon, uh, we need to introduce life forms starting with bacteria to build up the soil and moving on and on, uh, starting in fact with anaerobic bacteria because when we start there's no oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, but we'll leave that as an exercise for the bio biologists. They love this sort of thing. <laughs> well, Mars is kind of hard. How about Venus? How about terraforming Venus? Pamela Sargent says we can do it. And she's pretty smart. I like her. Uh, it's a challenge. The surface pressure of Venus is 92 times the Earth's atmospheric pressure. Or think of it as the pressure one kilometer under the ocean. The atmosphere is carbon dioxide, a little bit of nitrogen, mostly carbon dioxide. And that average surface temperature is 452 Celsius. Uh, that is the temperature inside your oven when you're running the self-clean cycle. Uh, it is a hostile environment. Uh, and those pretty clouds are concentrated sulfuric acid droplets. Uh, turns out these are all related. The surface temperature is so high because the surface pressure is so high of carbon dioxide. Uh, it is a greenhouse atmosphere par excellence. Uh, actually, a very young and brilliant planetary scientist figured that out in 1962 when he was trying to figure out why the radio astronomers we're looking at Venus with radio telescopes and saying, the radio telescopes say the surface is really hot. Whereas the optical astronomers were looking at it with infrared telescopes and saying, no, the infrared telescopes tell us that the surface of Venus is very cold. But the infrared telescope, the surface they are talking about is the top of the clouds. But radar penetrates the clouds and that's the rocks at the bottom. So this very brilliant young planetary scientist said, it's got to be a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. It has greenhouse effect. And it turns out Carl Sagan was right. Uh, it is the planet of the greenhouse effect, and that's what makes it so hot. Turns out in that same paper, he said, well, why don't we just terraform Venus? If we turn that carbon dioxide into oxygen, which is transparent to the infrared, we can get rid of the greenhouse effect, we'll cool down the atmosphere, just sprinkle some bacteria into the atmosphere, it'll all happen in a few hundreds of years. Uh, no problem. It'll convert the carbon dioxide to atmosphere, reduce the greenhouse effect. Unfortunately, what he didn't know is Venus didn't have just a little bit of carbon dioxide atmosphere. It had a lot of carbon dioxide atmosphere. He thought it had, oh, one or two bar, one or two earth pressures of atmosphere. Uh, it had 92. So finally he apologized in the book Pale Blue Dot, and he said, well, turns out my concept had a fatal flaw. If we tried to do this, we could make these acid tolerant bacteria that could use photosynthesis to convert the carbon dioxide 
into oxygen and carbon, you know what would happen? The carbon would spontaneously self-combust back into carbon dioxide. You'd be back where you started. Not that easy. Well, good idea, Carl. Didn't quite work. Well, the problem is Venus has just too darn much atmosphere. Converting CO2 to oxygen just doesn't work. To terraform, it's not simple. Really, you've got to get rid of that atmosphere. How much atmosphere do you have to get rid of? 500 quadrillion tons. You know, I keep throwing around these words, and people tend to get vertigo with too many aliens. You know, a billion, a trillion, a quadrillion. That's a large amount of atmosphere. How do you do it? How do you get rid of 500 quadrillion tons of atmosphere? Well, let's blast it away. Why not? Let's hit it with some asteroids. Turns out if you hit a planet with a big enough asteroid, you splash away a lot of the atmosphere. So, how many asteroids do you need? Well, you need about 2 million one kilometer diameter asteroids to get rid of the enough atmosphere. That comes to about 2,010 kilometers of asteroids. Good idea, but the problem is when we have the technology that allows us to move millions of one kilometer diameter asteroid, you know what? The people living in the asteroid belt are going to say, hey, no, you can't have those asteroids. We're using those asteroids. We're building stuff with these asteroids. You can't have them. Hmm. Well, how did Earth get rid of its thick atmosphere? Primordial Earth had a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. How did we get rid of it? Turns out it wasn't plants. Plants did not do it. Water did it. We converted our rocks into carbonate rocks. So actually, if we warmed up the planet enough and started outgassing carbonate rocks, we could Venus form our own planet. <laughs> uh, let's not do that. <laughs> but can't we convert the carbon dioxide to carbonate rocks? Well, sure. Uh, it turns out we'd have to pulverize about one kilometer of the surface of Venus uh, to produce enough rock surface area. And then we need a technique to produce the carbonates. On Earth, we do that with a process that's mediated by water, carbon dioxide dissolving in water, water precipitating carbonates. It helps if you have things like coral or seashells. Uh, but it's also a process that happened without uh, then, of course, you don't want to heat it up too much or they can decompose back to the rock and the carbon dioxide. Converting that one kilometer of surface into pulverized rock and then hoping that somehow we can convert that to carbonate rock might be tricky. Well, it's converted to something else. Well, the question is what? What can we convert it to? Well, here's a thought that uh, actually a uh, very clever and outrageous engineer Paul Birch thought about. Uh, why don't we just freeze the carbon dioxide? This turns out to be the craziest idea ever. The problem with Venus is it's too hot. But he says, well, no problem. We will shield it completely from the sun and freeze the carbon dioxide. Then we'll bulldoze it up to the polar regions and like cover it with a lot of styrofoam to keep it from, from melting. Yeah, it's a crazy idea. It just might work. Uh, this would be lightweight, like a solar sail, but uh, bigger. It would be a planet-sized solar sail. And it'll eventually cool enough so that the carbon dioxide freezes out. There are some engine, I call this problem, but I'm sorry, I should cross that out. Engineering details. <laughs> there are some engineering details here. Uh, that Venus atmosphere is a huge heat capacity. In fact, the whole reason it's hot in the first place is the atmosphere acts as a blanket that stops it from radiating heat to space. So it takes a very long time to cool down. Another question I have is, I'm not really sure that a planet covered with carbon dioxide snow dry ice, is really what you could call terraformed. Uh, 
school. But he said, well, maybe we can bulldoze it all <laughs> to some place. The polar caps and other regions of the planet are temperate. Like I said, he was a brilliant but crazy engineer. Some engineering details remain to be worked out. Well, what else can we do? We've got too much atmosphere. Or do we? Here's a graph of the temperature, it's actually sort of backwards, that lit the Earth, and you go up in the atmosphere, it gets cooler. That's the adiabatic uh, temperature lapse. So here's a graph that shows the temperature as a function of altitude, where I put altitude in the vertical scale. But it turns out, get up to this region, about 55 kilometers or so, that temperature 300K is right about room temperature. Wow. So the problem isn't that Venus is actually too hot. The problem is the surface is just way down below <laughs> the place where it ought to be. We need the surface to be up here, the 55 kilometer level. The surface is too far below sea level. Uh, if you go up, actually just about the top of the thick middle cloud layer, below the sort of thin upper clouds, but uh, top of the middle cloud layer, uh, Venus is actually really nice. In fact, we call Venus the hell planet, uh, but no, it's not. It's actually the paradise planet. If you float at that 50 to 60 kilometer range, the atmospheric pressure is one bar, maybe a little lower, depending how high you go up. You're above the main clouds. Temperature is 0 to 50 degrees C. Turns out this is the most Earth-like environment in the solar system. I should put a little asterisk there, uh, other than the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we just put our colonies uh, up there where the temperature is right? We Atmospheric pressure is about right. We wouldn't have to live inside a pressure vessel. Gravity is pretty close to Earth gravity, a little bit less. In fact, that's going to be a selling point uh, when I'm selling my cloud condominiums. I'm going to say, uh, come to Venus and lose weight. Uh, we have radiation shielding. Uh, and it turns out it isn't even hard to float on Venus. That carbon dioxide atmosphere helps because air is a lifting gas in a carbon dioxide atmosphere. And the lifting power is about half a kilogram per cubic meter. That doesn't sound like a whole lot, uh, but if we had a 400 meter radius envelope, a moderately big balloon, but you could float the Empire State Building in that, and the humans could walk around inside. Uh, here actually, when I was first proposing it, uh, this was the sketch that I drew of uh, uh, humans inside a city bubble floating in the atmosphere. And of course, I put solar panels in because you've got to have, got to have power somewhere. A nicer view by Don Dixon for the cover of a mostly forgotten book here by Mike, Ma, Mike McCollum. And if you can float one city above Venus, why not floating a lot of them? So we could colonize Venus with millions of floating cities. Well, actually, I did put that in a science fiction story, which actually made the cover of Asimov. So here's a, another artist's conception of sort of my, my floating cities uh, and some people uh, flying around in human powered uh, dirigibles. So I kind of like that cover art. <laughs> well, can we generate oxygen, though? Uh, so Venus is not home to life in the present, uh, but we could engineer an ecosystem. We just need some genetic engineering to incorporate gas bladders to float. So here's just an example. Here's kelp. Uh, kelp is, in fact, a plant that floats on the surface by uh, gas bladders. So we need to just re-engineer this a little bit and have it float in the atmosphere of Venus and start converting, well, maybe not all, but converting some of that carbon dioxide uh, into plant matter, 
giving us some more oxygen in Venus and making a planet on which another planet in the solar system with life. Oh, but here's a more radical suggestion. Uh, why don't we just build up above the atmosphere? Why don't we build a platform? Uh, we can convert some of the carbon dioxide to oxygen with plants, and then we build up the surface. In fact, my first thought is, let's just build up mountains. Why can't we build a mountain that's 55 kilometers high? Well, turns out there is a uh, limit on the height of a mountain. Uh, that limit is limited by something called the scale factor. The scale factor for rock is about 10 kilometers. Uh, so above 10 kilometers, the rock at the bottom gets squished out by the rock at the top. Well, that's not a problem. We just need to have rock that's tapered. So there's more rock at the bottom, less at the top. When you work that out, 10 kilometers, about 50 kilometers is what we need once we've converted some of that carbon dioxide uh, into oxygen. 50 kilometers divided by scale height of 10 e to the 5 turns out about 150. So the plateau at the top of the mountains is 1 150th of the base area. Well, so we're only converting 1 150th of the surface to something we can live on. But heck, that's still 3 million square kilometers. It's a lot of area. So you're not really terraforming the whole planet. You'd be terraforming a couple of little dots uh, on the planet. Well, I don't know. Uh, could we just build up with something better than rock? Well, essentially you'd be building towers on Venus. Or, you know, eventually you could build a whole shelf uh, at 55 kilometers on Venus. Uh, you'd have to do this with a high strength material. But we have high strength materials. In fact, uh, Actually, graphite composite materials would do it. You would have to work a little bit uh, on the polymer that holds the graphite composite together. Uh, that's a material science challenge, so I'll <laughs> leave the engineers uh, to sort of work on the structure part of the material science, uh, get working on the high temperature polymer materials. And then we just live at the high altitude parts uh, and eventually just build our whole ecosystem up there uh, 50 kilometers above the surface. I should have put some little plants floating above here that you can see them busily converting some of that carbon dioxide. Well, if we do terraform Venus, uh, there's additional problems. Uh, there's not very much water. There's some water those droplets of sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid, H2SO4, does have H2O in its chemical composition. Uh, you just get rid of the SO3 and what's left is H2O, and we can turn the SO3 into sulfate rock. So we can get some water on Venus. Not a whole lot, we need more. Not a problem in principle. Isn't that nice, not a problem in principle. Uh, there's many icy, objects in that outer solar system, uh, and likely bunches as close as the asteroid belt. Uh, okay, we'll go with fewer shallower oceans. Uh, I already did that calculation for Mars. Uh, Venus has a little bit less than four times the surface area of Mars. So those 150,000 comets we need uh, would give Venus a quarter of the surface a 250 meter deep ocean. Well, okay. Take what you can get. Uh, 150,000 kilometers, sorry, 150,000 comets for a 250 meter ocean. Okay. The sulfuric acid clouds you have to deal with, it's corrosive, it's hazardous, people don't like it. Actually, we've been dealing with sulfuric acid for a thousand years. We know how to make uh, material that is protective against sulfuric acid. In fact, the easiest material to protect against sulfuric acid is Teflon. Uh, in 1986, the Russians actually floated some balloons 
uh, in the atmosphere of Venus with the Vega mission, uh, and to keep them from being corroded by the sulfuric acid, they were covered with Teflon. So, okay. Uh, fortunately, it reacts with rocks uh, much more easily than carbon dioxide, uh, so we can sequester that sulfuric acid away by making sulfate rocks, gypsum, essentially. Uh, last, moderating that temperature. Well, today Venus is very reflective. So it is only 450 degrees C because it's actually reflecting most of the sunlight. Uh, once we start getting rid of those clouds, it's going to get a little bit hot. So even with the greenhouse effect eliminated, we're still probably going to have to shade the planet a bit to keep it from going back into its uh, runaway greenhouse effect. Not impossible, but this is going to be a long-term project. Well, let's look outward. There's more of the solar system out there. Uh, here are the moons of Jupiter. I'm quite fond of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, Callisto Ganymede, largest moon in the solar system. These three are very icy objects. Uh, this is a volcanic object. Turns out, actually, these three are pretty deep in the radiation belts of Jupiter. Uh, you don't want to go to these. Uh, because if you were to stand outside for a minute or two, you would die. Uh, <laughs> even if you had an atmosphere and a spacesuit, because Jupiter is a high radiation environment. Oddly enough, though, here Callisto, this big icy moon, uh, is outside the radiation belt. So we could go to Callisto. Still has some radiation, but it's not terrifically worse than, say, the moon or Mars, which are also places we have to worry a bit about. Uh, about radiation. So there's other places that might be interesting to go to. Uh, very icy objects, lots of water. Does bring us to a question, a good question for physics and philosophers, the ethics of terraforming. Uh, do we actually have the right to go and convert these other objects and make them into Earth-like? Uh, who should decide? Or, or maybe it's the other way around. Uh, maybe it's our duty to make these Earth-like. Maybe we're the agents that are supposed to make worlds hospitable to life. Uh, so these are the questions for the philosophers, engineers, lawyers, but mostly for the science fiction writers. <laughs> so, OK. Uh, just as a final question, you have been taking notes. You're ready for the quiz? <laughs> uh, here's the quiz. Which planet should we terraform? Earth. It's multiple, <laughs> it's multiple choice. Moon? It's close. And who cares what happens 3,000 years from now? Mars? Uh. Kim Stanley Robinson said so. Venus? Patricia Sargent said so. Pamela Sargent. Titan? Nice view of the rings. Earth? Well, <laughs> it's too cold in the winter. Too hot in the summer, let's terraform it. Or F, none of the above. Okay, let's have a show of hands. Who wants to terraform the moon? No. Uh, hardly any, four people. Who wants to terraform Mars? Well, mm, pretty good, about a third of the room. Venus? Ooh, almost half the room. Titan? Okay, I like it, some Titanites, yes. Earth? Oh, all the Canadians in the room, I said. A lot of Canadians want to go. And how, who say none? Okay, a couple of people arguing to keep Mars red. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, science fiction today, engineering tomorrow. And my agent told me once to always end by mentioning that I'm a science fiction writer. So I'm also a science fiction writer. Here's a website which I have not updated in, I think, four years now. But it will give you some background information and some information about the planets from the planetary data system. Thank you. Let's see, how about it starts from left to right? Left to right. Okay, so 
you know how you were talking about building those millions of different spaceships floating above Venus? What would the economy be? <laughs> Yours would be one thing, but is there anything else that they could do? Is there anything they could mine in the air? Or? Well, the question is, what do humans do for an economy? Uh, basically, humans use for an economy building and making the stuff that it takes to live uh, and live a good life. So we do the same thing in, uh, in habitats elsewhere, anywhere in space. Uh, it's probable that we'd be interested in some of the resources of Venus. We'd be sending probes down to the surface and bringing stuff up. We don't even know what's on the surface. Uh, but mostly it would be a place to live and humans would do what it is that humans do. Live a good life and uh, create art and write science fiction. <laughs> Uh, I guess left to right, this would be next. So in the expanse here, they uh, terraform, or they don't terraform, but they are starting to make um, objects in the outer, in the asteroid belt that are habitable. Um, and like specifically on Ganymede, they have, um, they build these solar sails. So would it be viable to like create a community scattered throughout the asteroid belt like that you've been depicting that you talked about here? Uh, well, Certainly, once we have the technology is to do some of the things I'm talking about, we have a lot of other things uh, that we could do. I wouldn't have picked Ganymede as my high choice. Uh, probably in the expanse, expanse, they must have some way of dealing with the radiation belts of, of Jupiter. Uh, but the giant mirrors that we've been talking about would also be solar sails. You could use these to ship things across the solar system, uh, it takes a long time. Solar sails are slow. They're the sailboats, and they're very slow sailboats, but they're cheap. So yes, you'd use this as in the expanse to make a solar system-wide economy of people shipping things from where you have it to where you want it. And uh, probably, actually, much as the expanse does it, a lot of what they're going to be shipping here and there is water. <laughs> because water is abundant in the outer solar system. It's rare in the inner solar system. Uh, very likely they would be shipping it here and there and very possibly using the solar cells. Let me take the last question and then okay. invite the ASX exec and the previous speakers back up to the stage. One more question. Okay, I guess I'm moving left to right and you're next and people on the far right, sorry about that. The right wing uh, <laughs> loses here. So uh, here you go. Yeah. Um, you talked about terraforming and how it affects the planet's atmosphere and the planet itself, but what about the domino effect to like, everything else in the system? Like, is there any, if it is, is it significant that you have to worry about? In general, uh, altering the surface environment of one planet is not going to affect things that are further out. Uh, the only things that might be affected if we are actually shipping. 10,000 comets here and there across the solar system and the asteroids, etc. cetera. Uh, you really got to start worrying that you don't make a mistake uh, in your aim point. Uh, because even two or 300 comets hitting the Earth would be a very bad day uh, out of these 10,000. So you do have to take some care uh, doing your engineering safety analysis. I would suggest, yeah. It's another problem for the engineers. <laughs> well, that's, the, that's for the quality of assurance and safety guys. So they should definitely be consulted. Let's have another hand to thank Dr. Lang.